tonight on Nation to Nation. The Madawaskat Malisee First Nation just settled the largest land claim in the Maritimes. And it began with the discovery 25 years ago of maps surrounding Evanston, New Brunswick. So I dug a little bit deeper and uh, when I did, I found that these lands were, were taken unlawfully. We also hear from a member of the Grassy Narrows First Nation in Northwestern Ontario. While the nation still suffers from mercury poisoning in their environment, the Ontario government appears to be rolling out the red carpet with gold mining companies. You know, they want jobs, but do we have, do we have to pay with our lives to through so these people can have jobs? Uh, that's that's uh, really not fair. Hello, I'm Todd Lamoran, and welcome to Nation to Nation. Land claims that take decades to negotiate with payouts that are in the millions of dollars are nothing new. Just recently, the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation was awarded $145 million in compensation. But its bill is the largest land claim settlement in the history of the Maritimes. It includes an option of inquiring nearly 800 hectares of land, and the payout to individual band members will reportedly be in the six figures. Talk about all of it. I'm now joined by Madawaska's Chief Patricia Bernard. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Chief Bernard. Hello. Now, just for a little background, why did you need to file a land claim? Well, this land claim process goes back over 25 years ago. Um, when I was a student at university, uh, I was an undergrad uh, majoring in history, and I came across some documents, particularly maps, that showed the reserve at uh, different sizes at different times. So I dug a little bit deeper, and uh, when I did, I found that these lands were were taken unlawfully. And um, after my undergraduate, I, I went into law school. I finalized a report and did a rudimentary legal opinion and submitted that to Canada in 1998. And uh, Canada sat on that claim for 11 years before coming back and saying that uh, they didn't accept the claim to negotiate because uh, there was never a reserve there which was uh, kind of confusing because we're on a reserve here and uh, there was no date uh, for the, the creation of the reserve. So I, we, I, at that time I was a lawyer and then uh, we went into the specific claims tribunal and we were in that process for five years. And during that process, Canada tried many times to get me off the file or diminish my arguments. They said I, was, I worked for specific claims at one time, so I was in a conflict. They said I couldn't use updated legal arguments or I couldn't use updated research, but those, those attempts failed. And um, in November of 2017, uh, the tribunal found in our favor. Uh, so it was a long road to the settlement. Uh, what does the settlement mean for your First Nation? Well, it's not only is it a personal sort of um, win for me because when you look into the history of this claim, when the government said that there never was a reserve there, it was all the intention of the province at the time to get rid of the reserve. And uh, about 160 years ago, the Indian agent came to the reserve after about 2,000 acres had been, uh, 3,000 acres had been taken away uh, because this the uh, reserve size actually included about 1,000 acres onto the United States side, uh, but they don't form part of this claim. But the Indian agent came and met with a man by the name of Louis Bernard, who happens to be my great, 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 great grandfather, and told him that the government was planning on selling up the rest of the reserve lands for settlement and asked him to move. Well, he was 90 years old at the time, and he decided that this was uh, this couldn't happen. And he traveled from our community to Fredericton, which is about 300 kilometers, uh, by canoe. He hired a magistrate and pleaded with the government not to sell his home. He had buried his parents and grandparents here, his brothers and sisters, his wives, and even his children along the banks of the river. And he couldn't believe that the government would do this to him. And, and, um, and at that point, it must have struck a chord somewhere because the, that's when the reserves stopped being diminished in size. And, and so it it's a, a, was a very personal thing for me because he was my ancestor and I was able to find justice continuing up until this day. Now, I've heard a, lo a lot of details of land claim settlements over the years that I've been uh, reporting on them, especially here at APTN, but not one where the majority 
of the settlement be, will be put into the pockets of band members. Uh, the local paper, the Daily Gleaner, reported $125,000. Uh, why did you decide to do that instead of put the majority into the trust fund? So um, we've, we, this is the second land claim settlement that we've, uh, we've received. And the other one, the first one we did was a smaller one back in 2008. And at that time, we had taken half of the settlement dollars and distributed per capita. And so there was an expectation on the part of the band members that that same policy would continue. So that's exactly what we did. So we took half of the amount and, and distributed it per capita. Then, of course, we opened up a legacy trust account, which would block uh, $50 million for over a period of 80 plus years. And then the revenue from that trust account would continue to support band projects um, and stuff like that. So we named the, we named the legacy trust the uh, Louis Bernard Legacy Trust. Uh, of course, settlement also comes with land, uh, land that was never surrendered. What's the details around that part of the deal? So with the addition to reserves, we can purchase up to 1,935 acres that um, the Canada has now committed to adding to reserve land. The only conditions are that they, the lands have to be in New Brunswick um, and they do have to meet the additions to reserve policy of the, of the government. So no environmental contaminants or financial liens and other details such as that. There's also no time limit on that. So we will be uh, consulting with the community to determine what type of land and what uses of, of, uh, of that land is gonna be for. So uh, we have time and uh, when the dust settles a bit, we'll be looking into uh, cons consulting with our community members on that. Now you were supposed to get nearly double the land in this deal. Uh, so what concessions, I guess, did you have to make to get the settlement to come to fru fruition? Um, well, we had to give up the land because the land that we lost has been is pretty much downtown Edmonston, the city, and the likelihood of getting that land back was was nil because I mean it was all th these are all sold to third parties and people's homes were there and it wasn't ever our intention to try and get that particular land back um, as it's that there are thousands of lots uh, that are that have been separated by by the uh, you know, the initial dispossession of land. So um, the concession we had to make is we are giving up our right to that particular area of land in exchange for this, uh, the new land that we'll get. Now, as you said off the top, uh, you described personally what it means to you. Uh, I guess, uh, what does it mean to some of your band members that they're finally gonna get this uh, settlement? Well, a lot of them have been um, very much involved as I've been uh, completely um, open and uh, every uh, three months I, I give land claim updates and I've been doing that for years uh, uh, we, through either through our newsletter or through our Facebook page. But um, so, so the community members were quite proud to, to know the history, to learn the history and, and to see some justice done for injustices of the past. But um, the actual money, the, the per capita distribution is definitely going to help a lot of band members to, um, you know, to, to help them, who, particularly the entrepreneurs, um, they're, they're going to pay off their homes, they're going to uh, um, start, like I say, start businesses or, or invest their money. A lot of them have, uh, have really great ideas on, on moving forward and they're going to, it's going to do a lot to sort of put them in a much better financial state than, than they've been in the past. Your situation, of course, is like many across Canada. So what advice would you give to other First Nations who are currently in a land claim negotiation with the federal government? Well, my experience has been uh, always, um, I've always kind of felt that there were roadblocks along, roadblocks along the way. So I would, any advice I would give is just never give up. If you know that what was done was wrong, in your heart, just be committed and don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Because Canada and the, the courts, there's always going to be disappointments as you go along and you should never let those things get you down. Just continue be, to be committed to fight and, and, and seek justice. Well, you certainly got justice, it sounds like, after uh, what you said were decades of fighting the federal government. 
Chief Bernard, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you. After the break, we talked to someone from Grassy Narrows in Northwest Ontario. Still suffering from decades of mercury poisoning, the community is now threatened by a modern day gold rush. Welcome back. The Grassy Narrows First Nation in Northwestern Ontario is still waiting for two toxic mercury dumps to be excavated. It's something the Ontario government has been promising to do. But while Grassy Narrows waits for a cleanup, the Toronto Star reports that gold mining claims have surged throughout their traditional territory. As many as 4,000 claims. NDP MPP Guy Berguin brought it up during the Ontario Legislature's question period. This government has been quick to consider mining claims while the fish are still unsafe to eat. The people of Grassy Narrows are hesitant to drink the water. Government House Leader Paul Calandra provided the response. It has to be done safely. It has to be done in cooperation with our partners in the area. He is also very correct that the previous Liberal government failed uh, the North, failed our First Nations communities. We're going to continue to, to advance uh, uh, policies in the North that uh, benefit not only our First Nations partners, but benefit all of the people of the province response. of Ontario. And we're going to do it in a, way, in a manner that respects uh, the rights of our First Nations partners. Thank you. Joseph Fobuster is a member of the Grassy Narrows Land Protection Team, and he joins me now. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Mr. Fobuster. Thank you. What did you think of this news when you first heard that the gold mining companies were staking claims near your community? Well, I'm, uh, I'm bothered that, uh, that uh, you know, we, we hear that uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, mining claims made uh, after we've uh, declared a moratorium on industry in, in 2007 and uh, and in 2018 we uh, we uh, call for a land declaration and, and to, to uh, halt all uh, uh, industrial activity, logging and, and uh, mining. <clears throat> and uh, even after the, the declaration was made, these uh, claims were being, uh, were being made against our, uh, it's against our law. So it's, it's quite, it's quite bothersome that uh, the government doesn't want to, uh, you know, listen to, uh, to to the people of Grassy Narrows. Now there's supposed to be a duty to consult your community. Uh, it sounds like government and industry has failed to do that. Is that correct? Well, I don't know what uh, I don't know if consultation is uh, enough. You know, there's, there's a lot of consultation that goes on. There's a lot of talk and uh, in the end, the, the, these companies are allowed to uh, do what they want. Uh, they, they come and talk to us, and they tell us what they're going to do. And and when they're done, they walk away and uh, and uh, you know start uh, start their businesses. I suppose. What is the about. biggest? Uh, excuse me. I, I'm sorry. I suppose. What is the biggest fear from community members? If gold is mined nearby, is it uh, the environment, damage to the environment, po the possible poisoning to community members? What exactly is it? Uh, everything that flows uh, into our waterway comes from, uh, you know, the, the water flows down into our uh, area. So the water that, uh, that that's going to be, uh, come from the, the mining is going to end up in our waterway and, and that's going to add to our, our already uh, our, our uh, mercury problem uh, and I, I don't know uh, much about uh, about the chemicals that they use but I, but I hear they're quite harmful so you know more poisoning is a, is a concern for all of us we don't as need you, any more poisoning. Right, as you just <laughs> mentioned, uh, 
You're talking about uh, the poisoning due to toxic mercury dumps upstream from uh, a pulp and paper mill in Dryden, Ontario. Uh, so I imagine your community is a little uneasy because of that history. Exactly. And uh, again, you know, uh, you know uh, poison being dumped into our water, we, you know, and uh, I don't know, it seemed like uh, there's a concern for uh, a lot of our neighbors, I guess, is that, you know, they want jobs, but do we have, do we have to pay with our lives to, so, so these people can have jobs? Uh, that's that's uh, really not fair. What exactly did the Mercury do to the people there in Grassy Narrows? What were some of the things that happened? Well, it's done a lot of harm. Uh, but, uh, First thing was that uh, our, fir our uh, commercial fishery was sh was uh, stopped. We can't sell uh, sell uh, fish anymore, and then the, the poisoning is uh, you know the, the, I think the the biggest uh, problem we have right now. Uh, you know, there's kids that uh, on the reserve that are uh, that are you know having learning difficulties. It is uh Kids have tremors. Um, myself, I I've been di diagnosed with uh, with uh, mercury poisoning, and you know I, I wake up at night and you know my my hand, my feet are uh, numb, and my my hearing is gone. Like uh, about fifty percent of my hearing is gone. I can't uh, I have to wear hearing aids, and also I've been uh, diagnosed with uh, glaucoma. You know, which is probably uh, you know, connected to uh, you know, the, the mercury. Now, I heard there were promises to, to clean up, or they're supposed to clean up this mercury that's in your environment. Uh, what's the latest on that? Well, I haven't started cleaning up. I, 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 uh, I hear a lot of talk about it, and uh, and. I'll, um, and I, well, first, I think the first thing that's got to be done is uh, they, they, they uh, found uh, that you know mercury is still leaking into the waterway, and you know they have to find where, where that leak is before before they uh, before they do anything else. You know they, they uh, want to start mining while uh, you know while they while they ignore the. Uh, the other problem of um, mercury poisoning or um, mercury contamination. So what you're telling me is they don't even know where the how the mercury is even getting into your, the environment in your community. I'm not. Uh, I'm not fully. Uh, I'm not. Uh, listen, reread the paper every day or reading the news, but uh, but little I hear is that uh, that you know fifty. Bells or of uh, of uh, mercury were were, uh, were buried in soil somewhere around the, around the, the Dryden Mill, and uh, I don't know if it was uh, if they've if they've ever uh, dug up those uh, or found where, where those fifty barrels are buried. There have been possibly more, but uh, that was one number I heard. Oh my goodness. Now there was a big announcement, of course, two years ago about a mercury treatment center. Uh, what's the status of that, do you know? Well, uh, last year, I think we finally got approved for to build a, a mercury treatment center for, uh, I believe it's $29 million it's going to be worth. They, uh, they're going to be breaking ground probably this, uh, this spring to start building. So that's, that's going ahead and that's a, a good thing. What do you hope, uh, what kind of results are you hoping to get from this treatment center? I don't know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of people that uh, will, will get uh, better care for, from, from uh, having a treatment center right in the community. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Fobister, I'm just wondering, uh, what would you say to Ontario Premier Doug Ford today if he was standing there right in front of you? 
Well, I, 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 I've been uh, we've been asking to uh, for the government to, to withdraw the, the these claims that the that, that are these permits that they're that they're asking for. Uh, we had a meeting uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, people from the MNDM for, for mining development, whatever, and uh, and uh, it, it's the same old message. We'll work with you. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, they say this is not. Uh, th 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 we're just doing exploration or, or test drilling, but you know these explorations and test drilling are going to lead to mining. So why not stop the, the test drilling and the exploration before before it starts? So this is what this is what we're asking for. We want we we want these uh, permits withdrawn. Because you know, it's a, it's a, they're in violation of our uh, of our uh, of our laws that we we've uh, impl imp implemented. Okay, Mr. Filbuster. And, uh, <laughs> I want to be, I want to get out of our, our territory. <laughs> well, on that, uh, Mr. Filbuster, I uh, hope to, uh, there is a resolution to all this, and I want to thank you for speaking to me right now. Okay, thank you for having me. <clears throat> we'll have more after another short break. Welcome back. It was a busy day on Parliament Hill for Bill C-15. That's the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples legislation. It began its second reading, where MPs debated on it this morning. One of the bill's biggest advocates is NDP MP for Winnipeg Centre, Leah Gazan. It is a critical step towards replacing the Indian Act with human rights. This government needs to act now, and I cannot express that strongly enough because the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is essential. At the very same time, the Indigenous Affairs Committee continued its study of Bill C-15. A few days ago, Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde appeared. He came with a dozen amendments he thinks C-15 needs. Today, Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand appeared. He only had one suggestion, that the terms racism and systemic racism be added, but under one condition. As long as it does not hold up this bill, this bill needs to get in and get royal assent and for us to make history and for us to show the world that why this country is ranked number one. And so for me, uh, why we're not seeing amendments from the Métis Nation is because we want this to get true royal assent first. We can still fix it in the future. And that's all the time we have for another week. As always, if you want to check out our previous episode or listen in your car or on your mobile device, consider subscribing to the Nation to Nation podcast. Go to aptmnews.ca slash podcast. I'm Todd Lamarant. Thanks for watching, and please keep safe and stay healthy.